Today's sermon is Saved by the Bell. There's a beautiful story in 1 Samuel 25 of how a woman intervened in David's life and saved him at a moment when he was being very, or on the verge of being very ungodly. And his anger was getting the best of him. I, th- I don't know if there's another sin that's as volatile in our lives as anger. I don't know if you know this, but of all the, the states in our union, the number one state for road rage is Colorado. And I believe it. And I've contributed to it. When people cut you off and are mean on the road, you drive a little bit closer than you should, you flash your lights, you wave at them, you give them the, 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 the finger, um, you honk the horn excessively. Um, sometimes people even turn their vehicles into weapons and try to push people off the road. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy what people do when those buttons are flipped when you're in a, in a vehicle. When I was in seminary in the, state of, or in the city of Cincinnati, I was driving home from working at a church across town. I came down the, the freeway, and I was getting off on this exchange onto uh, the Queen City Boulevard. There's a bridge there, and I pulled on this bridge, and this car zips up next to me, goes in front of me, and then just stops on the bridge. And there's no other cars around. Uh, he stopped. I'm stopped behind him. I thought, what just happened? He just, like, stopped his car. He gets out of his car. I thought, maybe he's going to ask me something. But then he pops the trunk of his car up. And he starts to reach inside. And I says, I don't think this is going to end well, so I better get out of here. So I zipped around him and took off and got out of there as fast as I could. Uh, because road rage is something that's very dangerous. And you can go on YouTube and watch some very crazy videos of people who've turned into um, these violent uh, drivers, motorcyclists, truck drivers, car drivers, because uh, someone had pushed their buttons. We're going to look at a story today where David, he's a man after God's own heart. I mean, there's a wonderful David who, who acts in ways that are far better than most of us ever act. And yet we're going to see in this story today how David gets at a moment of time where someone pushes his buttons, his passion gets the best of him, he's about to do something very horrible. And yet God brings someone into his life to intervene to redirect his path, to spare him from the regret of doing something very awful. And I want to challenge you today to listen before you leap, to reflect on what God may be saying to you through other people before you take a a reactionary step. Many times we get get pent up and we say, I've got to do something, I've got to act now, and now's the moment. And God says, slow down, fella, slow down. You're going to do something very bad. And you're going to regret this later. Listen to what I have to say to you. And oftentimes, just like with David, it's a woman that God brings in our lives. For me, it's often my wife. Says, what are you thinking of doing? Why would you want to say that? Why would you want to do that? Do some of you have have, have, men have wives like that? Yes, yes, a lot of it. And some of you have husbands like that. And we're so grateful that God brings those persons into our lives. So let me give a little background. It's 1 Samuel chapter 25. Remember last week, David... Uh, had an opportunity to kill Saul. Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. David and his men says, this is the opportunity God has given. Kill that man who's trying to kill you. But David can't do it. He says, it's the Lord's anointed. It's not my role. And so David honors him, speaks honorably to him, humbles himself before Saul. So this guy who does something that most of us would never do, then turns around and does something that's like, David, are you the same guy that just had so, so much patience for Saul, but you don't have patience in this situation? So let's, let's start here. Uh, David, after he honored Saul, actually takes his men, and they go, they're still on the run because you can honor someone and still not trust them. And so he honored Saul, but he doesn't yet trust him and says, we're going to keep our distance from Saul. So they go off, go off into a place where they can kind of mind their own business and, and catch their breath. It's in the wilderness of Paran. And there it says, there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel. The man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. He was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. And the woman was discerning and beautiful, but the man was harsh and badly behaved, and he was a Calebite. So David and his, his men are there, and this guy there, Nabal, it's the only time we hear of him in Scripture, just in this chapter. He's very rich. Uh, he doesn't have stock, but he has livestock, which is how they measured wealth in those days. Because your animals contributed not only the meat, But before you slaughtered them, they contributed wool, they contributed milk, they contributed things that you could sell, market, use. And so this man has thousands of of livestock. He's a very wealthy man. It's time of shearing the sheep. Now, it, it contrasts this man named Nabal, who's harsh and badly behaved, and 
his wife Abigail, who's beautiful and discerning. And you wonder, how did, the, how did they hook up? I mean, what did she see in him? Good question. I, I wanted to ask some of you guys like that, about that. You know, how did, how did she... <laughs> st- <laughs> Don't laugh too loud, Steve. <laughs> yeah. How did, how did she end up with him? And you know what? It's true oftentimes, opposites attract. There are, there are things that we see in another person that says, you know, I'm introverted, they're extroverted, you know, I'm a carefree spirit, they're disciplined, they're going to help me, you know, manage life. And so, you know, it's a balance. And I'm so glad that God brought into my family my mom to help balance out my dad, because our life would have been miserable if my mom was like my dad. Uh, but she was able to temper him and work with him, and she was kind of the, the Abigail in his life. And so it's time for sheep shearing. This is like harvest season. Uh, harvest season is always a time of celebration because it's a time of gratitude for God's provision. Whether you're harvesting the grapes, uh, harvesting the, the wheat, in this case, harvesting the wool. So they're shearing the sheep, a lot of festivities. So David decides to send his men to ask for a favor. It says, David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent 10 young men. And David said to the young men, go up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. See, my name's going to carry some weight. Let him know you're coming on behalf of David. And thus you shall greet him. Peace be to you. Peace be to your house. Peace be to all that you have. I hear that you have shears. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we did them no harm. And they missed nothing all the time they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever you have in your hand to your servants and to your son, David. In those days, thieves often lurked in the hill country. You know, they didn't have police patrolling the area. And so thieves would come in, marauders would come in, they would steal your grain, they would steal your animals, they would steal family members, they would hurt people. And so there's always this fear of of the thieves and the thugs in the area. But David's men are just, they're biding their time. Like, what can we do? Well, we might as well contribute and we're just gonna help patrol the area and keep it safe. And so they do that and nothing is ever taken. I mean, it's such a peaceful place. It's sort of like when you have... um, Guys, remember the Hillsboro Baptist group? You know, they, would, they would go and picket and protest at certain funerals of people they didn't like. And all of a sudden, this group rose up of veterans who formed a biker's group. And they would show up at these funerals to provide protection for the family so they could have an honorable funeral. And it's kind of like this here. David says, you know, my men, they're strong. They're, they're armed. They're capable. They're the guardians. Just roam the fields. Keep things safe for these people so they can prosper. And they do. And David's just saying, hey, it's, it'd be a good time then to, to pay these guys back, to bless them. So, and then let them know that you come in the name of David, his son. You know, kind of, kind of uh, not, not biologically his son, but, but David's on his side. David's your friend. You do want to do something nice for David. So when David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal in the name of David, and then they waited. And Nabal answered David's servants, who's David? Who's the son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from their masters. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I've killed from my shears and give it to men who come from I do not know where? So David's young men turned away and came back and told them all this. I mean, Nabal, it's not that he doesn't know David. He's basically saying, in this town, David doesn't mean squat. His name carries no weight. We got a lot of people who run away from their masters and show up. He's just another one of them. He's running away from Saul. I'm the big dude around here. And by the way, it's my stuff. It's my water. It's my food. It's my sheep and my shears. And and I can do with it as I want. And I don't want to share it with these guys that I have no connection to. So the answer is a big fat no. You know, by the way, I've met a lot of people, a lot of men like this whose wife says, hey, honey, we ought to give to that ministry. We ought to support that mission. And the spouse says, you know what? I've been working pretty hard for my money. It's my stuff. I don't even know who these people are. No, the answer is no. And and you miss a great opportunity when God says, I prospered you to be a blessing. I I blessed you to be a blessing to someone else. This is an opportunity. Nabal, you've had a bumper year. This is a a great year. But he's like that guy in the the story Jesus told, this parable of a man who had a great crop, but it was so big he had to tear down his barns and build bigger barns. And he kept saying, I need to build bigger barns to put my stuff in. And this guy says, this is my stuff. he's, He's not seeing himself as a steward, only as an owner. And we are stewards of all that God gives us. And when David hears this response from Nabal, he is livid. It's not just like he's, he's disappointed. He's, he is ticked off. It's like this guy not only rejected my request, he insulted me. And you don't insult David. David said to his men, 
Every man strap on his sword. And every man of them strapped on his sword, and David also strapped on his sword. And about 400 men went up after David, while 200 remained with the baggage. David is so upset, he says, we're going to go take care of this, and we're going to do it forcefully. Not only are we going to take, away, take out Nabal, you can read later in the story, we don't have time to go through the whole thing, but, but he also is going to kill his wife Abigail and every man in that community. He's going he's to make a mark. He's on the verge of doing something he's going to really regret. And here's the first lesson from this story. Beware of vices that can quickly ruin you. Beware of those times where you get a button pushed and you become someone that's very different than who you've been. David chose to honor the Lord's anointed and not touch him. And yet here's this jerk over here named Nabal, and he's getting under David's skin. He goes, how dare that little guy, that little pipsqueak over here, treating me like this. I'll teach him a lesson or two. You know, he... He's getting to David, and David's passion, which will show up in a number of cases, you know, we'll see next week, David becomes very passionate in his worship. David's passion, he's looking out the window and saying, I want that woman over there named Bathsheba. I mean, he's very passionate, and his passions sometimes are good, and sometimes his passions get him into trouble. In this case, it's getting him into trouble. His emotions are bubbling up. It's, it's like a volcano ready to explode. It's his besetting sin. You know what a besetting sin is? It's, that, it's, it's one of those sins where... It, it trips you up quite often. It, it catches you. It's that, it, it's that sin that nags you, maybe different from someone else's sin. In the book of Hebrews, it says, let us lay aside every weight and sin which, took, which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. This sin that clings so closely, it's like a dog hair on a sweater. I mean, you're like, wow, my goodness. And so you have a weakness in your life that's probably different from the weakness of the person next to you. It's different from my weakness. Yeah, I'm not tempted by drugs and alcohol, not in the least. doesn't even interest me. And some of you go, man, Pastor, that's one, of my, that's one of my besetting sins. I struggle with alcohol. Someone else will say, my struggle is pornography. And someone else says, wow, that's not an issue for me. Someone else says, I struggle with anger. Really, says, no, that's not an issue for me. See, we, we all have these different weaknesses that are in our lives that, that we struggle with. And just because you overcome it one day doesn't mean you're, you've got to lick the next day. And that's kind of one of the things I want to point out is one victory does not end the war. David did not retaliate to Saul. He did not, he did not let his temper rise against Saul and cause him to do something he regretted. But now it did. It's like, David, time and time again, you showed patience with Saul, but all of a sudden, right now, this moment, being you flipped the switch. You're a different person. It's because the past victories, when he's overcome that rage, now he's given in to it. And I say that's probably true of a lot of people. 95% of the time, you win the battle. It's this 5% of the time when you lose where you make the mess. It's when you lose. And it is a war. Paul says, I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind. The members meaning his body. There's this, there's this war going on. And as long as you're in the human body, as long as you're on this earth, you will war against sin. You can never say, oh, those, those temptations? <laughs> Lick those back in, you know, 2015, it's over. I don't have an issue with that. Be careful. Be careful. Because it'll pop up again, and it'll get you. It's kind of like whack-a-mole. You know, bam, got that thing. And, oh, there's another one. Bam. And then, oh, another one. Bam. And it pops up, and sometimes it, it catches you off guard. It is a, a battle. And it's those moments where you lose the battle when you give in. But it really hurts you and hurts the people around you. Here's another thing. It's the stones, not the mountains, that'll trip you up. And what I mean by that is when you face something big, like a big, like I'm going to overcome this sin in my life, and I've got the safeguards and the new patterns, like I'm going to deal with that thing. And you do well. You really do well. But it's when you're not paying attention and something sneaks up on you. It's like when I climb up a, a mountain, you know, I'm focused on the path and I'm watching my steps and do really well. You know when I trip up is when I come down and I'm careless. I'm just like, you know, it's easy. I'm, I'm moving along, and all of a sudden there's a, there's a rock or there's a root, and I trip over it and fall down. It's because I'm not paying attention. It's those little things that trip you up. It's usually not the big thing. It's, it's the little things that get you. Saul was a big thing. Nabal is a little thing. And David's getting tripped up by the stone. This happens in sports all the time where you have a, a, a big, powerful team, and they're a little bit overconfident, and they take on the, the little guy. This is, they call them David and Goliath battles, but they take on the little one. And this happens a lot in, 
the NCAA basketball tournament, which is just coming in a couple weeks. It's called March Madness. And you know why? It's madness because the little guys, the, 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 the ones that are ranked lower that are 14th, 15th, 16th, oftentimes knock off the one, two, and three seeds. In fact, the, there was never a time when the number one seed got beat by a 16 seed. I mean, they're vastly different teams. Never happened until 2018 when a little college named UMBC, by the way, I, I, I doubt if there's anybody here who knows what that stands for. University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Really, it sounds like a community college. They're taking on the University of Virginia, which was one of the favored teams to win the whole tournament. Virginia had only lost two games that whole year by a total of eight points. And so they're playing each other in this tournament. And of course, it, it's hard to get up for a team that's, that's not as good as you. So, that, that, you know, psychologically, hard to get up. UMBC says, this is our one big shot. Let's give it all. We do or die. Who cares? Let's give it our, our, our best. And they had a phenomenal game. I mean, so phenomenal that they were 20.5 point underdogs, yet they won the game by 20 points. And Virginia had to live with this humiliation, being the first number one seed ever to lose. And not just lose, lose big. But here's the good news for Virginia. Next year, they won the whole tournament. Good for them. Let's, let's put that loss behind us because now we got the, the tournament victory. But that's what happens with sin. Like, I don't, I don't struggle with this anymore. I can have a drink. I, I, can watch, I can watch that movie. You know, I can be around those people. You know, I've overcome that sin in my life. And all of a sudden, you get pulled in little by little back into that lifestyle that you thought you were free from. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. When you start thinking like, I don't need the Lord's help anymore, I beat it, that's when you've opened yourself to defeat. Because we always need the Lord's help. You always need God's grace to say, God, I still need you every day. I'm a, I'm a human being struggling in a sinful world. I need your help. As long as I'm in this body on this earth, I need the Lord's help. And so Nabal's response catches David off guard. It's like that little stone that trips him up. And he flies into a rage. He went postal before there ever was a post office. And it leads to some very, very bad thoughts. Proverbs 14, 17 says, A man of quick temper acts foolishly. And when anger gets the best of you, it brings out the worst in you. You think hateful thoughts. You say hurtful words. You act in harsh ways. Watch out for the little things that will push that button. And I think the reason why David was so offended by that is one of the reasons why we often get mad. It's because of our pride. How dare you treat me like that? And when ego drives you, it's time to hit the brakes. When ego is pushing you to, to retaliate, to take something out on someone else, to react rather than respond, we need to step back and, whoa, 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 why am I so offended by this? Dave, David, why are you so offended by what Nabal said? He's a nobody. Why does it bother you? Let it go. Let it go. People in high places often do very dumb things because of the other actions of lesser people, at least lesser in those minds, in their mind. Um, a few years ago, in Sarasota, Florida, was a man who was running for office. He was pulled over for speeding, going 57 in a 40-mile-an-hour zone, was texting while he was driving. Police officer pulls him over, and this man starts to talk down to her. He says, I'm a congressional candidate. I know the chief of police, the mayor, and the city administrator. How long have you been working as a police officer? She said, seven years. And he says, um, if you follow through with what you're planning, he says, this will be your last year, and I'll make sure of it. She sticks to her guns, doesn't back down. She gets the support of her supervisor. She writes him three tickets, speeding, texting while driving, and failing to display his, his vehicle registration. Problem for this guy was all of this was caught on her camera and was broadcast on the news. This man couldn't hide. And so he came out a few days later with a public apology. And here's what he said. I'm not going to justify my poor temper on that day or attempt to mitigate it in any way. There will be some who will say it's not the first time I've acted out and they'd be right. I have faults and one of them is to be overly aggressive on occasion when I'm challenged. And guess how he did in the election? He lost in the primaries. Yeah. People said, that's not the kind of guy we want leading. If he, if he, if he gets his buttons pushed that easily, but that's what happens. Uh, a po politician, a, a broadcaster, a pastor. You know, 
just in a moment says something they shouldn't have said, does something they shouldn't have done, crossed a moral boundary line that they shouldn't have crossed. And even though they've done well 95% of the time, it's that one mistake that may cost them their church, their business, leadership, their career. Paul writes in Philippians 2, 3, do nothing. Say nothing. nothing. Say nothing. nothing. Do nothing from selfish ambition. Nothing. He says don't do it. Just don't do it. If you're being motivated because of your pride, don't do it because what you're gonna do is wrong. And so this gets reported back to Abigail. One of the servants of Nabal comes back and says, Abigail, this is what's happening. And, and, and there's gonna be a big mess, a lot of blood and all this. So I, I need you to go back and, and do something about this. And so she rises up and she goes to work. She bakes 200 loaves of bread, grabs a couple skins of wine, prepares five sheep, grain, raisins, 200 um, cakes of figs. She sends it with the servant ahead of her and then she goes to meet David herself. It says, when Abigail saw David, she hurried and got down from the donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed to the ground. She fell at his feet and says, on me alone, my Lord, be the guilt. Please let your servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your servant. She does one of the bravest things anyone could have ever done. She goes, I know this guy is on a mission to kill my husband, maybe a bunch of other people, and someone needs to intervene and I'm gonna be the one to, to risk my life. So she's very generous, gets all, this, all these provisions that David requested together, brings it, and then she humbles herself. Four times in this little paragraph, she says, my Lord, she bows before David, and she basically asks, would you, would you hear me out? Would you listen to your servant? See, here's, here's the second point I wanna bring from this passage, is be aware of voices that can quietly rescue you, that God will often bring someone into your life to speak truth where you need it, to avert a tragedy. Abigail is so much different and better than her husband. She takes it upon herself. Hey, blame me. Blame me for all this. I'll take responsibility. Don't, don't do what you're about to do. It says in Proverbs 12, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. And now we're gonna hear the advice from dear Abby, okay? Three things she does, and three things I think wise people do when they're speaking into someone else's life to steer them in a better direction. Number one, they hold you to a higher standard. She says, let not my Lord regard this worthless fellow, Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, folly is with him. The name Nabal actually means senseless or foolish. And, and so what she's saying is, that's who he is, that's what he does. David, that's not you. You're a better man. Don't stoop down to his level. See, oftentimes, that, that person who's pushing our buttons wants to bring us down to that level. And, and we need to be reminded of that's not who I am. So I'm not gonna act the way you are. You know, political rallies will often bring a heckler into the crowd to try to get someone off guard, try to push the, the speaker's buttons. Sports has the, um, the trash talker. Trash talkers get in your face and they try to disrupt the emotional state of the star on the other team. Because if they can rattle them, they says they're going to throw them off their game. They're going to bring that athlete down to their level. Sometimes they cause the other athlete to start fighting with them. Sometimes even get thrown out of the game because they're bringing them down to their level. And Abigail says to David, don't do that. Don't, don't be like my husband. I apologize for him. But David, don't be like him. It says in Proverbs 26, 4, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Mark Twain says, never argue with stupid people. They will drag you down to their level and then beat you with experience. Okay. <laughs> Here's the second thing. Good advisors remind you of what God will do. She says, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord and evil shall not be found in you as long as you live. If men rise up to pursue you and seek your life, the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundles of the living. Don't you like that? Your life will be bound in the bundles of the living. Sounds <laughs> like such a, David, you're wrapped up in the arms of the Lord in the care of the Lord your God and the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the hollow of a sling. David, God's for you on this. He'll take care of it. This is not for you. Remember, you, you said vengeance is not, is not mine, it's the Lord's back with Saul. Leave this to me. I will sling them out like stones from a sling. What do you think that's a reference to? David taking down Goliath. David, you remember that? One little stone. Do you think that was all you or do you think God guided that single stone to hit Goliath where it needed to land? God was with you. He's fighting your battles for you. He'll do the same here. He'll sling those enemies out 
He'll take care of it. You be the king. You be the godly man you need to be. And then she does one other thing, which may be the best one, warns him of potential painful regrets. Wise advisors warn you of painful regrets. He says, she says, and when the Lord has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you prince over Israel, my Lord shall have no cause of grief or pangs of conscience for having shed blood without cause or for my Lord working salvation himself. David, don't do this. Let God be the one that works salvation for you. Don't do it for yourself. Don't, don't live in such a way that you're gonna have regrets and you're gonna have a mark on your record that years down the road you're gonna look back See, one of the things that I found very helpful is to play it forward. Like, think about what you're about to do, and then, then go down the road and say, if I did this today, um, well, how's it going to affect my marriage? How's it going to impact my kids and grandkids? What's going to be my legacy in the community if I do that? I mean, think about this. If you're, if you're considering having an affair, how's, it, how's my spouse going to handle that? What are my kids going to think of me when they find out I did that? What's the community going to think of me and how unfaithful I was to my spouse? Like, I don't, I don't want to deal with that. No. This moment of passion, this moment of temptation, no. I will not do it because I'm seeing where that's going to take me. You, you look at that temptation, you look at the actions you're feeling at the moment and say, no, I don't want to live with regret. And so David receives from her not only her gifts that she sends, but the wisdom that she, that she provides. It says, David received from her hand what she had brought him, and he said to her, go up in peace to your house. See, I have obeyed your voice and I have granted your petition. Now, it's not the end of the story because Abigail then goes to tell her husband what she had done, how actually she'd done a good thing and spared him from dying. And he's busy partying. He's got this big party going on, the festivities. He's drunk. She says, well, I'll have to wait till morning to tell him. She tells him the next morning when he's more sober and he is stunned. I mean, his buttons are pushed. He has, he has a stroke. It says he turned like stone for the, for the next 10 days, and then God took his life. God took his life. David didn't have to. God did it. And David has such, such admiration and respect for this woman that he says, I would like to take you as my wife so you're not a destitute widow. And she accepts, and she becomes a wife of David, and they have children together. And her life is, is so much better for the future. And as I look back at this story, I think, how many of us are like Nabal? Probably a few. There's probably some people in the room, maybe some men in particular, who are very possessive of everything God has given you. You think you've earned it. It's all yours. You don't want to share it. And God says, hey, I've prospered you. And when, and when someone comes to you, one of my people, and says, hey, there's a ministry that needs you, that needs what you can do, the use is God, I'm in. God has blessed you. He'll bless you even more. I want you to be generous with what he's given there's some of you that are probably like Abigail. You are. You're incredible. I mean, this woman is unbelievable. She speaks into his life. She's so humble and honoring, yet courageous enough to speak truth, to challenge the future king of Israel in such a way that, that redirects his whole course, that, that brings his temperature way down. He says, that's a special woman. Some of you women in this room are like that. Praise God for you. You've kept your husbands from making big mistakes. You've kept your kids from jeopardizing their future. But I think there's probably some men like that too. Very, very wise men who are very cautious and humble and God-fearing and you've done the very same thing. Thank you for who you are. God's put you as a rescuer in someone's life. But I would say the majority of us, we're like David. We really wanna seek God's heart and do the right thing and probably 95% of the time we do, but it's those little moments where something pushes the button. Something tempts us in a way that we realize, hey, I'm getting out of control with this thing now. I can't handle this thing now. And some of you have actually crossed the line. Anger's got the best of you. You've hurt someone really bad with your words, with your actions, out of your anger. And there's forgiveness for you. You might have to live with some scars from it, but there's forgiveness and there's grace. And maybe today's a day to say, God, I, I actually need your help with my anger. God, I need your help with my passion. God, I need your help with my negative emotions because they're rising up within me when these things happen and I can't handle it by myself. And God says, I know that. That's why I gave you the Holy Spirit to help you. So I'm gonna ask, um, I wanna ask you to stand. And I wanna pray over anyone here who's like a David. If, if it's in your heart to 
to do what pleases God, and yet you, like David, find yourself at certain moments struggling to honor that commitment. And maybe even at times in your life have actually crossed the line and done something you're ashamed of. Would you be courageous enough just to raise your hand? Because I want to pray for you today. Keep the hand up, and let's just close our eyes. Father, you're not, you're not here today to shame any of us. You're here just to help us acknowledge that we need you. Oh, we need you. We cannot handle sin by ourselves. We have an enemy out there who seeks to devour us, and we can't win the battle on our own, so we need your grace. And as you promised to provide a way out every time we are tempted, help us to see that way out. Help us to listen to the wise voices that speak into our hearts. Help us to listen before we leap. Help us to do what honors you. May we, may we live upward to the calling of Christ, not downward to the actions of those who hurt us, who offend us, who upset us. And may you shine through us, Lord. May you be faithful to do what you promised to do. And may we, st may we just stand back and praise you for the fulfillment of your promises. You are a good, gracious God. Vengeance is yours. You will do what is right. Help us to do what's on our end, the right thing to do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.